I want to give special thanks to my Patreon and channel supporters that make these videos possible. It's them that provide the funds for me to travel to museums and without them, this content would not exist. If you are not a German native speaker and at the conclusion of this video are able to pronounce the full name of this aircraft, well, then you deserve a medal. Hello everyone and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck and this is the VFW VAK191. VFW stands for Vereinigte Flugtechnische Werke, a post-World War II West German conglomerate of Fokkerwolf and Weser Flugzeugbau GmbH, temporarily also joined by the Dutch Wacker Company. Now VAK or VAK stands for Vertikal Startendes Aufklärungs- und Kampfflugzeug, which incidentally also explains the role of this aircraft in one compact three-letter designation. Welcome to Germany. Now the aircraft itself is operated by a single pilot. It's 16.4 meters in length, has a wingspan of 6.2 meters and a height of 4.3 meters. Empty it weighs about 5,500 kilograms and goes all the way to 7,800 kilograms for maximum VTOL takeoff uh, and 9,000 kilograms for maximum short takeoff. It's an experimental VTOL aircraft with the name translated to Vertical Takeoff Reconnaissance and Strike Aircraft. Thus, it's the German entry into an exciting chapter in aviation history. There are only about two on display at the moment, both in Germany. So, let's have a closer look at this one, found at the Flugwerft in Schleinsheim next to Munich. The aircraft has three engines, one Rolls-Royce Mann Turbo RB193 and two Rolls-Royce RB162 turbojets. The single RB193 with 10,000 pounds of force was located in the middle of the aircraft, providing thrust along four rotating nozzles for vertical lift and for cruise. The nozzle range of motion is about 95 degrees and it was also this engine that was used for flight. Two RB162s with 5,600 pounds of thrust each were situated fore and aft of the former engine, providing extra power for vertical lift. Mounted internally, they were canted aft at 12.5 degrees from the vertical, and when not in use, they were covered by retractable doors. The lower door on the forward engine as well doubled as an air brake. Now, to prevent the aircraft from somersaulting in case of failure in one of them, they were coupled. The aircraft also had a maximum speed of about 1,100 km per hour, but the range of the aircraft isn't that great. With an internal fuel load of around about 2,100 liters, the range sits at only about 400 km. Although as a prototype, this would have certainly changed with time as development went on and different loadouts were being proposed. Then again, for the VAC, range really wasn't that high of a priority. The aircraft followed NATO's requirement NBMR3, which called for a strike aircraft as a spiritual successor to the Fiat G91. The aircraft's role was meant to follow essentially the same logic. You take off at a short distance from your actual target, you close at high speeds, and then you blow stuff up. In fact, the earliest plans with this aircraft was that it would drop nukes, small, little, 2,000 pound nukes perhaps, but nukes nonetheless. So let's have a walk around on the VAC-191. Up front here, this area houses a lot of the electrical equipment, the flight computing and so on. TACAN is also in here. And as we move along, you can obviously see the maintenance hatches here on either side for quick access. Then we have the pitot-static tube. And as we move along, we can see the rear hinged clamshell canopy for the pilot. Then we have the air inlet for the RB193. That's the big engine in the aircraft. And then down here, we see these 
little doors. Those are for the RB162s. There's also two more doors on top of the aircraft. As you can see, these open fore and aft, whereas on top they open to port and starboard. The front one is also doubling as an air brake here, but this is the only flap on the bottom of the aircraft that doubles as an air brake. As we move along a little bit further, one thing I would also like you to check is the gear. Now we have one gear wheel up front, which is somewhat of standard, you would say, in a tricycle uh, landing gear configuration, but the aircraft isn't a tricycle. More on that later. As we move along, we come to the rotating nozzles of the RB193, the big engine. And these can, of course, be swung, depending on what you need for your vertical takeoff and landing, you know, towards cruise position, essentially, towards the landing and takeoff position. And there are two on either side for the engine. And below that, actually right below the engine, you will also find the bomb bay for your ordnance. As we look further on, we have, of course, the wing. But before we do that, let's have a look there. And there you can find the gear of the rear gear of the aircraft. And it is, in fact, a bicycle configuration. Fair enough, it's a twin wheel at the back. But that puzzle will be solved soon because a bicycle gear configuration will probably be a little bit unstable of an aircraft. But we have, of course, an answer to that. 48 degrees sweep on the aircraft here on the wing. The wing loading of the aircraft is actually quite high, roughly 610 kilograms per square meters. And here we have the outriggers. These actually provide the stability and the ability for the aircraft to land and take off. You have the same thing on the Harrier, right? So small gears set on either side. You have one other on the, uh, on the port side as well. And they, of course, fit into this uh, tear-shaped outrigger that we have here. Also, on either side of the wings, we have air bleed puffer systems that provide that thrust on either side in order for the aircraft to maintain stability as it is taking off and landing. Now, moving further towards the rear, we, of course, find the aileron and the flap of the aircraft. And moving on further, we have another electronics panel right here. And we have the all-moving tailplane here with the vertical stabilizer and of course the rudder. Up top would be your antenna also for the radio and the IFF system if it was ever fitted. And then last but not least, we come to the back. We have another puffer system there as well. And of course, we have a drag chute added to the aircraft as well. As a recon and strike aircraft, the weaponry will naturally center around explosive stuff. Below the fuselage, there is a dedicated space for a 2,000-pound nuclear weapon. Given that uh, nuclear the nuclear strike rule was one of the core of these designs, it's very reason to exist, really. There wasn't much else planned at the beginning. You could probably have added some extra ordnance on the wings, but given the lack of space, it would probably be only a single hard point, really, uh, that is the limit on the present wing configuration. Later on, on a redesign, it actually envisioned two hard points per wing as the wing was lengthened, but the project stayed on paper at that point. No decision had yet to be made on the cannon armament, but it would probably have been some sort of Mauser, considering that it's a German aircraft. So we're on the port side of the aircraft, just up front as well, we have antennas for the radio. And then this is most likely the area where a cannon would have been fitted if the aircraft was ever pushed forward into mass production. However, since that didn't happen, we can only speculate. We also have the RB162 engine here. As you can see, there's a nice little cutaway. To give you a look at the engine that is fitted fore and aft of the RB193, which gives the main thrust of the aircraft. And this uh, engine would also be used, for example, in the Dornier Do 31. Let's have a look inside the cockpit. It couldn't be opened, so an outside view has to suffice for today. Sadly, there is very little information available on the uh, VAC 191's cockpit. In fact, I haven't found a single reference with any real detail on this. So I go into this blind, but it's not too hard figuring out the basics if you are familiar with the systems of the time. Given the lack of info on this cockpit, it's rather exciting getting this on film. We of course have the ejection seat here. That's a Martin Baker. I believe it was a Mark 9 in fact. Next to it, what looks like a mountain jig. This might have been used to house a camera or equipment during flight testing. Looking inside, it was hard to spot any instrument with the naked eye, let alone the camera. I'll keep this restricted to the left instrument panel 
as this was the only one we were able to capture in any detail, but luckily it's also the most interesting part. Starting closest to the pilot, the communications panel for the UHF. Above it, or rather to the right from our view here, the fuel systems control panel with the low pressure fuel cocks. Above that, the grey lever is for the main high pressure fuel cock, currently is set to closed. To the left, the trim control. From top to bottom, we have roll, pitch and yaw. Next to it, most likely the stability control switches. Then we move on to the throttle. This one might be familiar to you. It's the same one seen on many aircraft of the time like the Fiat G91 or the F104 Starfighter. This one operates the main RB193 engine. The throttle has a speed brake switch and press to transmit button. As you can see, there are actually two rails here and out of view must be the lift engine control lever for the two RB162s. To the outside of the throttle, the flaps. And moving to the inside, the nozzle angle selector and the preset stop. These are of course for the main RB193 engine and would be used to turn the uh, nozzles for VTOL takeoff and landing. Due to the reflection, not much can be identified throughout the cockpit, but maybe in the future I can return to the Flugwerft and have a close look in a better light condition. And at that point, I'll of course bring it to the channel as well. The VAC191 got off the ground, but it never really went far. Development began in 1961 and in 63, the VAC had secured NATO's go ahead versus the competition. Ironically, one of the competitors was actually the British Hawker P1127, which eventually led into the Harrier as Britain dropped out of the NATO program. In 67, Fiat from Italy, the only other NATO co-developer with the aircraft, left the program as well. NATO too decided that a policy of massive nuclear retaliation was a bit harsh and wanted a more flexible conventional solution. The VAC simply couldn't do that. Its design was one of high-speed, one-pass nuclear strike. A second concept was drawn up indeed, with, uh, which extended the wings, as I said, and operated the engine to allow more conventional payloads. But that was a fool's errand in the end. There was nothing really that could save this aircraft. Uh, development, however, was continued into the 1970s as a testbed and as a proof of concept. By 1970, the first aircraft had also been put together and a first flight was conducted in 71. A first successful VTOL takeoff followed a year later. Now, Germany then invited the US to join development once more, but by this point, the multi-role combat aircraft MRCA program was already on the way. So again, nothing. But hey, MRCA eventually led into the Panavia Tornado, so we got that flexible machine after all. So I hope you enjoyed that look at the VAC-191, a rare VTOL aircraft from the Cold War period. I want to thank my Patreon and channel supporters for making this sort of content possible. It is their support that allows me to cover all the costs associated with actually making these videos, from traveling over to lodging, food and so much more. Without them, this sort of content would not be made, so if you enjoy what you're seeing here, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon or via channel memberships here on YouTube. If you can't do that, don't worry, I understand. There are many ways of supporting the channel as well, for example, by simply sharing this video with your friends and on the internet. Please consider subscribing and hitting that bell button so we'll get notifications for upcoming videos. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.